Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part five of Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry by Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer. 35. There is a thread of tradition connecting modern masonry with the most ancient mysteries of antiquity. The ancient landmarks may be discovered in every nation and time notwithstanding the connection that so evidently exists, says Dr. Rebold, between the ancient mysteries and the Freemasonry of our day. The latter should be considered an initiation rather than a continuation of these ancient mysteries, for initiation into them was the entering of a school, wherein was taught art, science, morals, law, philosophy, philanthropy, and the wonders and worship of the symbols of nature. 36. The universal science and sublime philosophy, once taught in the greater mysteries of Atlantis, Egypt, Chaldea, Persia, and India, has been a dead letter in modern Freemasonry. But these sciences and the sublime philosophy is taught in mystic masonry as it never was in the ancient mysteries. The candidate can become proficient in the ancient wisdom if he is willing to do so. Nothing of the ancient mysteries will be withheld from those who are willing to learn. 37. It should be borne in mind that in modern Freemasonry, in the ancient mysteries, and in all the great religions, there was always an exoteric portion given out to the world, to the uninitiated, and an esoteric portion reserved for the initiate and revealed only in the degrees, according as the candidate demonstrated his fitness to receive, conceal, and rightly use the knowledge so imparted. Few professed Christians are, perhaps, aware that such was the case with Christianity during the first or third centuries. 38. This, in its purity, as taught by Christ himself, was the true primitive religion as communicated by God to the patriarchs. It is no new religion, but the reproduction of the oldest of all and its true and perfect morality is the morality of true masonry, as it is the morality of every creed of antiquity. 39. Says St. Augustus, what is now called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and was not absent from the human race until Christ came, from which time the true religion, which existed already, began to be called Christian. 40. In the early days of Christianity, there was an initiation like those of the pagans. Persons were admitted on special conditions only. To arrive at a complete knowledge of the doctrine, they had to pass three degrees of instructions. 41. There was an exoteric and an esoteric doctrine with the early Christians. The esoteric doctrines were communicated orally in all the mysteries of initiation, and these mysteries conformed to and were originally derived from those of the so-called pagan world. The mysteries of Christ received a new interpretation after the first Nicene Council and as the church sought dominion, it lost the great secret and since then has and does deny that it ever existed and has done and is doing all in its power to obliterate all its records and monuments. 42. Neither Christianity of today nor modern Freemasonry is the direct and lineal descendant of the greater mysteries of antiquity or supreme initiation. The fraternity of the Rosy Cross and ancient mysteries alone have preserved the key of interpretation. 
Modern masonry never possessed this key, but may if they are willing to accept the terms. 43. Modern Freemasonry honors as its ancient teachers Zoroaster, Pythagoras, Plato, and many others, and in some of its degrees, gives a brief summary of their doctrines. Masonry, in a certain sense, includes them all, and has adopted their precepts. They were all initiates in the mysteries, and fundamentally, their doctrines were the same. They all taught the existence of the great architect of the universe, the immortality of the soul, and the unqualified brotherhood of man. And with these primitive and fundamental truths, Masonry is in full accord. 44. The Entered Apprentice starts on his career with the triangle surmounting the square. Spirit has not yet descended into matter. As he progresses, the descent takes place, and we have the triangle in the square. And finally, as a master, the ascent of the square into the triangle begins which every master mason will understand. Masonry being a progressive science, the progress of the neophyte is thus made to conform to the process of evolution and the descent of spirit into matter. And this is illustrated by the manner in which he is taught to wear his apron in each degree in the Blue Lodge. The entered apprentice is not only a hewer of wood and a drawer of water, but is a novice, taking his first instruction, and this is symbolized by his apron. 45. The tradition of the master's word, of the power which its possession gives to the master, the story of its loss, and the search for its recovery, the tradition of the infallible name in connection with the lost word, showing that it could not or should not be pronounced except with bated breath or, as the Hindu tradition declares, with the hand covering the mouth, the symbol of the three greater and three lesser lights, and the play made in many places on the word light itself, in conjunction with the lost word. All these references and uses constitute a complicated symbolism working in and towards a common center or glyphic, which taken in conjunction with the building and restoration of the temple constitute the secret symbolism of masonry and illustrate the whole process of initiation. What real initiation is has always been stated. These symbols, when correctly interpreted, serve two purposes. First, they reveal a complete philosophy of the creation of the universe and of man, unfolding all essences powers and potencies, and their mutual relationships and correlations. Second, they unfold the process of initiation as synonymous with the uninterrupted evolution of man, guided by knowledge and design along the lines of least resistance. In the third degree, the candidate impersonates Hiram, who has been shown to be identical with the Christos of the Greeks and with the sun gods of all other nations. The superiority of masonry at this point over all other exoteric religions consists in this. All these religions take the symbol for the thing symbolized. Christ was originally like the Father. Now he is made identical with the Father. Here lies the true meaning of a bith, of or from my father, Hiram, Christos, and a bith, at one with the father, i.e. of or from. In deifying Jesus, the whole of humanity is bereft of Christos, as an eternal potency within every human soul, a latent Christ in every man. And thus deifying one man, they have orphaned the whole of humanity. On the other hand, Masonry, in making every candidate personify Hiram, 
has preserved the original teaching, which is a universal glyphic. Few candidates may be aware that Hiram, whom they have represented and personified, is ideally and precisely the same as Christ. Yet such is the case. This old philosophy shows what Christ as a glyphic means and how the Christ state results from real initiation or from the evolution of the human into the divine. Regeneration is thus given a meaning that is both apprehensible and attainable, both philosophical and scientific, and at once ideal and practical. In the Tetragrammaton, or four-lettered name of deity, the Greek followers of Pythagoras found a glyphic by which they both expressed and concealed their philosophy and in this Hebrew tetrad, IHVH, or Yad He Vahi, that is introduced into masonry with the Pythagorean art speech. The devout Hebrew, in reading the sacred text, when he came to the tetrad, Vad He Yab He, substituted the word Adana, or Lord, and if the word was written, the points of Ahim, he called it Elohim. This custom is preserved in masonry by giving the candidate a substitute for the master's word. The Hebrew tetrad, Yad He Ba He, is pronounced by repeating the He. The root word is a triad, and the quaternary is undoubtedly a blind. The sacred word is found in the mysteries as a binary, a trinary, and a quaternary. As with the Hindus, we have the Om and the A-U-M, indicating different methods of pronouncing the sacred name. 46. This secret of the lost word is carried on and fully explained in the higher degrees of mystic masonry, and as already stated, the candidate is taught not only the meaning of the sacred name or lost word, but is taught the word itself. 47. The secret doctrine is the complete philosophy of Masonic symbolism. So long as the philosophy is unknown to the Mason, his symbols are, to a great extent, dead letters, the work of the Lodge, a dumb show, beyond its moral precepts, and the genius of Masonry for the members of the craft is largely the spirit of self-interest, mutual support, and physical enjoyment, or revelry the latest embodiment of which is the mystic shrine. But there are some among the members of the craft, and how many times alone can determine, who believe that masonry means far more than this, and who have already discerned in its symbols and traditions something of the real meaning. Many of these have found practical clues which served to keep interest alive while searching for plainer meaning and deeper revelations. In retracing the steps which these ancient symbols and their profound philosophy have came down to our times more and more obscured with every passing century, students have gathered a large number of facts, a great mass of traditions, and general information, all of which have been variously interpreted by different writers on masonry. All writers, however, agree in the conclusions that the symbols and traditions of Freemasonry come from the Far East and go back to the remotest antiquity. 48. After the candidate is obligated and brought to the light in the third degree, he is bantered with the statement that undoubtedly he now imagines himself a Master Mason. He is informed not only that such is not the case, but that there is no certainty that he ever will become such. He subsequently starts on his journey for the discovery of the lost word, the method by which he undertakes to obtain it, and the names of the three fellow crafts have a very deep significance. After many trials, he receives a substitute, Maha Bone, which he is to conceal with great fidelity, till future generations shall discover the lost word. In the rites of mystic masonry, the lost word is not only found, but taught the candidate. 49. 
the method by which he receives and is ever to transmit or use even the substitute is made exact and definite and guarded by solemn obligations. The meaning of both the great secrecy and the use of the word are left entirely to conjecture beyond the statement that it is a sacred name and must never be profaned or taken in vain or carelessly used. And I venture the opinion that not one mason among 10,000 has ever been able to discover why. 50. The force of the obligation is therefore in the obligation and not in the reason. As a matter of fact, the real reason is scientific to the last analysis, scientific to a degree beyond the penetration up to the present time of the radiant matter of the rank and ray of modern science. The word concerns the science of rhythmic vibrations and is the key to the equilibrium of all forces and to the harmony of eternal nature. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, Wars of the Roses desperately needs your support at this time. Please consider donating through PayPal and Patreon. The links are in the description. Thank you very much. Many of these have found practical clues which serve. Many of these have found many but many of many of these have found practical clues which served to keep